Hey everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Fight Chat Friday where we have a very, very special guest, Mr. John Mackey. Uh, this whole chat precipitated from a comment that we got on one, one of our videos just a couple of weeks ago uh, from a viewer in, in Bulgaria who was asking a very, very pertinent question right now. What do we do if, uh, or how do we plan for a competition from three months out, four months out, you know, from, from a good distance away? Where do we start? What do we look at? What do we work at? And given where we are right now with a lot of countries kind of coming to the point where they might be moving out of COVID and back into training in person, it really does ask the question of, well, where do we start? How do we plan and where do we go from here? So Richie, do you want to introduce John? We'll get ourselves started. Yeah, so for anybody who isn't aware of John, John has an extensive background in ITF Taekwondo and Wacko Kickboxing. Um, John is also a performance director. Is that your title, John, for Canoe in Ireland? Performance director with Canoeing, yeah, that's right, Richie and you also just got a, is it a degree or masters you got in coaching science that right that's correct yep just last year Richie just finished it up so nice and fresh uh, with all the research for us to help out on today's topic so do you want to just give a, a quick introduction to your own background John for people who are coming across you for the first time yeah sure Richie no problem very quickly um, as, as you rightly pointed out I come from an ITF background um, I, I started training in 1987 uh, I opened my own club in 2004, so yeah, coming up on 20 years now. Um, went into kickboxing, uh, joined Kickboxing Ireland in 2005, became their national coach for light contact and kick light in 2014, and I'm currently the director of coaching for Kickboxing Ireland. Uh, in a professional capacity, as you said, I work for Canoeing Ireland, so I'm the performance director there, working with the two Olympic sports, the two Olympic canoe sports, and uh, yeah, I've just finished up a master's degree last year focused on coaching and performance science and um, happy to say I, I managed to pull a, a first class honours in, in the results so, and, uh, yeah no chuff with that and the piece of research that we were doing for the dissertation has been uh, put forward for publication by the college to one of the sports science journals which has been uh, recently accepted for review which is a which is a um, great Brilliant. result great result something I never thought I'd be able to do or achieve so yeah I'm really happy with that so we're in the middle of uh, just looking through the review reviewer comments and, and making some edits and uh, looking at some of the suggestions from from the reviewers and hopefully it gets published so it's, we're looking at the journal of sports science and medicine at the moment so very fingers cool. are crossed yeah very cool very cool yeah and uh, thanks for having me on again um, guys it's always great it's always great to be here chatting with you lads yeah, that's ah, what I was just going to say. We had John as well uh, last summer. So we had a big chat about the 10,000 hour rule and things like that. Right, so yeah. we'll pin that yeah. video up for people if they want to watch it after this one. Um, but as we said, Adrian, we had a question in from our comments there from Leah, who was suggesting maybe, especially at, at the moment now with coming out of COVID and maybe people haven't been training for a while, people with a, mm -hmm. an eye down the road towards tournaments. How are we going to get started with our training and and prepare a little bit of a training program to build back up that strength and build in your speed back up and things like that. For some people, they've been able to keep going and they have the luxury of maybe having coaches who are at a very high level and have facilities to keep going. But for some people, they haven't been doing much, John. So um, yeah. I guess they, where, where do we start? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, and. It, it, I suppose it, it, it very much depends on, on each individual, but what I would suggest is that um, you know if you've got access to the outdoors and you can and you can leave your house during if there's local restrictions or national restrictions, is to get out and start start getting your you know get your your, your low intensity your your long duration your high volume work done to start building up your aerobic capacity again. So just your fundamental ability to sustain exercise and entities. So you're not going straight back into the dojang or into the club and, uh, you know, being gassed out, in, you know, within the first 30 seconds of just, just routine training. So get out and get some, get, get out and get some miles done, get some kilometers done, build up that, that aerobic base. If you've got access to, you know, to weights at home or to some, uh, you know, some option of lifting or body weight exercises there's no reason why you can't be doing that uh, either so i mean we could probably um we could probably dovetail that question into the to the broader principle of planning for competition or yeah. what's termed periodization mm -hmm. which is uh, and periodization is essentially and simply just it's it's a it's a concept of of planning your training as you um 
as you prepare for an event or events throughout the year. Uh, originally conceptualized by the Soviets in around 1960, late 1950s, I think, Leon Matveyev, kind of the, known as the godfather of the concept of periodization, which is effectively just sequential um, uh, planning of certain physical and physiological attributes that the athlete or the individual can train uh, yeah. in preparation for an event. And, and the reason why it's spread out over such a long time is that there are certain physiological parameters, for example, the aerobic base, as it's known, takes a considerable amount of time to stimulate stress in order for the body to make mm -hmm. significant adaptations or improvements. So you can build on those foundations as you get closer to your event and your training structure changes and the focus changes uh, to be more sport specific, etc. So periodization is generally is simply just, you know, scheduling and putting a calendar plan together for your training. So you're not just doing things ad hoc or, uh, you know, piling things on top of each other that might not be best practice. But from, from a, a wellness and from a monitoring point of view and from an injury point of view, it allows the athlete and the coach to monitor that, to make sure that there's recovery within the, the training block and to make sure that, um, you know, the athlete is a, you know, is a human being, right, has, has time and has uh, opportunities yeah. to go and be a human being and to do everything that we should be doing outside of our sport. So yeah, it's periodization very, very is, is, is that. simply that. Simply that, yeah, absolutely, mm. absolutely. Sometimes, yeah, think, especially think... in combat sport. Go ahead. Richie. Go on, Adrian, you're good. Work away. Okay, so what I was going to say anyway, we all had something to say there. I think what, what I was going to say was yeah. just that uh, periodization is looking to challenge that or solve that age-old problem of uh, so many things to do, so little time. And, you know, and, and that is, mm. I think, when you get to the very, very top level, that's what uh, athletes are trying to do. They're recognizing that time is short. They only have so much of it. All of them have been given the same number of hours in the day, same number of days in the week, and it's whoever uses it wisest and most effectively is going to be the person who gets the most progression in that particular time period. Sure. So, you know, again, I suppose that's it. That's always the concept with periodization of, well, how do I get the most use out of the time that I have? How do I use it most effectively? And, and, and a, a part of that is looking at, well, I could train anything. What am I going to train that's going to give me the greatest improvement mm -hmm. in what matters at the end which is the end yeah. of the day performance so how do we go about figuring out in the beginning i suppose john what to train yeah yeah uh, and i think we have to kind of start with the end in mind and we have to look first of all mm -hmm. we have to understand our sport and we have to realize what are the physical and physiological demands to uh, of the sport that a I need as an athlete in order to be able to perform and to train at the highest level that I can possibly be at for uh, for a given time. So from a, an ITF Taekwondo perspective or a WACO kickboxing perspective, because they're, you know, they're both closely related, I think, in terms of the physiological and physical demands, especially the tatami or the mat sport uh, element of kickboxing, the physical demands uh, requires to be able to, to kick fast, to be able to kick strong, to be able to hold our ground, to be able to move around the ring um, and have agility, to be fit enough, to be aerobically fit enough to uh, last the duration of, of all of the rounds. And in ITF Taekwondo, I think it's still the same where the, the fighter will go through the, the, the pyramid system or the the, the, yeah, in the, one the, day. Uh, the section in one day, you know, so there's yeah. a, a, a massive amount of endurance capacity uh, needed for that and recovery ability. And then when you get right into the meat of it uh, and you're, you're actually in the ring or you're, in, you're on the mats and you're exchanging, you need to have sufficient anaerobic capacity and power to be able to throw those explosive shots when they need to be, uh, when they need to be thrown and then to be able to recover adequately so you can do that multiple times over the course of a round. So and there's lots of other things in terms of the psychological conditioning your skills training, your tactics and strategy, you know, you ask the question, why do we need periodization? Well, you know, there's a, there's a great example. We have to now cover all of those bases in our training yeah. program. So if we understand mm -hmm. that, so we've, we've started with periodization and then we've taken a big jump to the actual event. What do we need to be? Now we need to go back to the start and say, right, I know where I need to go. I know what I need to develop. Now I need to understand personally within you know within within my camp or with my coach and with everyone that's in it what do i need where are my weaknesses and what are my what are my strengths so i need to know um analyze what i actually need from all of that i may already have 
the fundamental strength and, and, and power capacities, but I might not have the aerobic ability to get me through the round, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. there's a... Mm-hmm. There's a, a, a definite need to assess what the athlete needs. You're not just going to throw them a program and just assume that they need everything. Um, and then you'll identify weaknesses and program accordingly. So starting with the end in mind, it's those physical and physiological demands, those psychological or cognitive demands, and working backwards and then developing a program um, and, 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 you know, and starting to build out all of those capacities. Speaking with the end in mind, John, I think that's an important point because um, this is – targeting towards maybe one or two major events in terms of the high level periodization at least while still trying yeah. to keep up in touch with your your physical attributes as such so it's not for people who may be watching i'm gonna almost kind of be the translator here for the two people <laughs> who have the the coaching science backgrounds adrian and john but it's not really the whole idea of trying to do this for every single tournament that you might have maybe once a month or whatever it's, it's more of the big events and that's important point as well when we're talking about working backwards as well yeah yeah absolutely and i mean there's there's a number of different formats that periodization can take and if we're if we're specifically talking about athletes who are kind of new to the concept of of periodization and and getting the foundation right for their physical preparation um, you might look at what's called a linear or a block approach to uh, the periodization program, which effectively does, uh, Richie, look at a, a big event towards maybe the end of the year, for example. And I know in, in WACO, the world and Europeans are generally around September, October, November time. So you've got that kind of long run in. But yeah. the more an athlete is, is experienced and, and the more they're attuned to this type of training, um, and you, you do have you do have important events throughout the year, such as World Cups and and other events that you like to be able to assess performance in. So you don't want to be going in kind of half-baked. You want to be going in in, in some sort of yeah. peak condition. So you can, you, can, you can play around with the direction of your program. And, and in, in, in the science, they call it this kind of concurrent method or, or an undulating periodization format, which allows an athlete to kind of peak several times during the year. Now, that takes experience. It takes an experienced coach's eye to know how to peak and how and, and when to taper and to monitor training load and stress load and, and, and stuff like that. But to, to keep it very simple for today, you're absolutely right, Richie. It's about starting with the big event in mind and, and, and mm-hmm. working back from there and trying to fill the gaps, you know, put, put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, that makes it, uh, that kind of brings us back to that very, very start position of, well, okay, so the question was, I suppose, looking at this one, uh, maybe you're three or four months before, uh, what, you know, what do we start with? And the answer, I suppose, as always is, yeah, it depends. But, uh, it, you know, now that we're getting to the, it depends on what, uh, what are the different yeah. things that, uh, that it might depend on? We're talking about the individual athlete and where their gaps are or sure. where their kind yeah. of, the, the, the areas for them to maximally improve live. So, yeah, that could be an interesting uh, uh, place to jump off then. Sure. Uh, and, and into this deep water of uh, you know which type of periodization, what do we include when? Um, so yeah. when you're starting, whether it's you know a, a canoe athlete or a, a kickboxer or a taekwondo athlete, um, you know what's the first step in almost debriefing the season before and deciding okay, what does our preseason look like for the season ahead? What does our season ahead look like? What's yeah. that process look like? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll stick with kickboxing and taekwondo for this one because the, the, the canoe calendar is, is the opposite way around. So we've got <laughs> athletes in Italy at the moment who are preparing for the European Championships coming up in a couple of weeks. So they're, they're big events and it's an Olympic qualifier. So their big events are, are quite close to the start of the year. But let's let's talk about a calendar that maybe most of the listeners will be familiar with. And that would be probably the WACO calendar or the ITF calendar where the events are kind of later in the year, mid to late in the year. And let's just take... Let's just take this this discussion with a, a blank page um, and just say we're, we're dealing with an athlete who has, let's say, they have good experience in competition, right? So they've been around, but they don't have they don't have a whole lot of experience in in, in training systematically and preparing systematically uh, for their event. So let's just let's just say that we've come out of the of the World Championships and the World Championships were held in September uh, last year. Let's just make up a, a hypothetical situation that people can relate to. The fighter has come out of that uh, event. They'll go into a period of, of downtime, so they'll they'll take time off and recover and just you know just transition back into normal life. They'll come out of the bubble. 
Um, and at some point when they're ready, uh, whether that's four or five or six weeks, they'll start to creep back into some form of maintenance training. Okay, so they've they've tr- they've you know they've trained for a, a, an extensive part of the year. They will have um, they will ha- have built up certain capacities and you know you don't want to be sitting on your on your backside for a period of time more than six weeks after an event because you start to lose those capacities through the concept of detraining so you'll start to get back into doing something to maintain those adaptations and and, and those improvements that you've made and then you get into you, you get into the pre-season so that could be right after Christmas for example you've had your bit of downtime you've done your bit of maintenance training you're keeping yourself ticking over and you're into January let's say for example Um, and from a linear or a block periodization perspective the first kind of 8 to 12 weeks of that block is spent on uh, traditionally spent on I suppose uh, building those strength capacities and building out those um, aerobic capacities so they take about 8 to 12 weeks um, of high volume uh, training in order to to stimulate adaptation for those physical and physiological capacities. So, what does that look like in the weights gym? It means it means very systematic and standardised kind of strength training, not necessarily um, training for hypertrophy or size or training like a bodybuilder, but un- using the concepts of strength training in order to increase those strength capacities. So you're you're getting functionally stronger through pulling and pressing and squatting and uh, you know, and all these kind of functional movement patterns. Um, and on the, at the same time, you'll be building your aerobic base. And what the science tells us in terms of how you best do that is to spend an awful lot of time, so high volume, at low intensity uh, uh, training. So that might, inc- for example, might include long distance, low intensity runs. Um, and y- you can, I think, you know, there's, there's there's a conversation out there about running and whether it's useful for, for combat sports and so sort of, it, it is in, in this particular context because you could you could stimulate your aerobic system by doing rounds and rounds on the bag at certain intensities, but you could be there for hours doing rounds and rounds on the bag. You know, so it's easier to to pinpoint certain physiological parameters by doing low intensity running, for example, and doing lots of it. So you'll spend the first eight to twelve weeks kind of building out those strength and, and endurance capacities. And then you start to move closer into the, the, the pre-season. And this is where the sport kind of sport-specific conditioning stuff starts to um, kick in. Uh, you start to work on your strength speed uh, development, your power development, and your speed strength development. Um, so, you're, you know, you're lifting weight, uh, lighter weight faster. So the focus is on velocity. Uh, you'll be using medicine ball throws. Just as an example, there's lots of other modalities that can be used. Um, and you'll be doing. You, you'll now be starting to gradually move into the kind of sport-specific sparring elements of your conditioning, uh, getting used to high rounds, high-intensity rounds, and then supplementing that maybe outside of the gym with some uh, high-intensity interval training, whatever shape uh, or format that takes that suits you best. And again, the periodization kind of model allows us to plan the week uh, right down even to the day to understand where those. Uh, that type of training fits. So you probably wouldn't go to the gym on a Monday, do two and a half hours of strength and kind of strength foundation training and then have your lunch and go and do an hour and a half of, of, of running. Some people do and that's great. It suits them. But from a training load perspective and to allow the body to rest and recover and regenerate, you might say, well, look, I'm going to take the run out of Monday and I'll move it to Wednesday. Uh, I might do something mm-hmm. different on the Tuesday, maybe an active recovery day. Um, and that's periodization in, in motion. That's it in, in practice, effectively, from a, you know, from a meso or a microcycle perspective. And then the closer it's you get to the event... It's important, John, isn't it? It's, it's that's, massively that's important, mass- Richie. Yeah. People, they just almost kind of just kind of see what they see online and say, oh, that's a great exercise, and let's get to work there and do this for a few weeks. But the, what you're saying there about having a structure and having a plan is massively important. First and foremost... Because, because adaptation or, or progress, physical and physiological progress, Won't the progress that, that you're chasing in the gym, it doesn't happen unless you give, give the body time, downtime to actually mm. allow it to happen. A lecturer of mine actually said in college to give it, to give it some uh, uh, an analogy, and um, to use an analogy, was that the training is actually done it when you're sleeping. The activity is done in the gym and, and on the mat, but the actual training is done while you sleep, rest and recover because that's when the real mm-hmm. progress takes place. Adaptation only takes place 
when you allow it to through rest and recovery and, and regeneration. So if you don't understand the concept and the importance of recovery, and I think as in combat sport in particular, uh, a lot of our athletes don't understand the absolute importance of taking time off to allow the body to, to improve. So they just they just pile on all of these layers of training, you know, and it's all this mm. go hard or go home if you know no days mm-hmm. off and all of this this macho nonsense that kind of reverberates around gyms and some training halls. Uh, it's absolutely crucial to take time off, and periodization allows you to say I'm going to take the Wednesday off in order to regenerate, to recover, and to get better, mm-hmm. to allow my body to to build that resilience. But you see, I think it, the, the other part of that then is, you know, from a mental point of view, you're not taking the day off. You're doing what was planned for that day. Yeah, and I think as an athlete, yeah. that feels better yeah. than I don't feel like it today. Yeah. I'm taking my day off. Yeah. It's, you know, it's planned. And then I suppose leading into yeah. that is you've layered all of these things together, you know, different things happening at different times. And I, I, I look at pulling up a bit of a graphic for that. But um, hmm. One of the things that you're constantly trying to monitor then is the program density at all times. So like the overall load on the athlete yeah. and like, sure. so maybe a, a very quick chat. You, you've talked about having rest days. You talk about active rest. You've talked about, you know, uh, maybe moving things to different days as appropriate. But I suppose the mm-hmm. big question that comes in from a very practical point of view for our Taekwondo people is, well, how much do we ac- actually need to train before periodization becomes really I suppose a factor you know great point you know because again if you take your average person who's probably watching this one you know and and we can just say look our audience is an awful lot it's people who are hoping and aspiring to get to a higher level but maybe not Mm -hmm. already the Mm -hmm. ones who are crushing it and winning world titles uh, for the most part Mm -hmm. not every day anyway but the what what they're at is like okay how do I progress from I go to my coach two or three times a week for an hour an hour and a half and I do a little bit of work in the gym myself in the background to I actually really need to like consider how I plan this if I'm to progress because otherwise I'll be working against myself. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So what well, you're talking about is how do we measure progress, Adrian? Am I right? Yeah, pretty know? much. How do we measure progress how and how we do we measure, measure reaction to load? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great point, a great question. Um, I mean, what what I do, what I do with with, with with my, with I was my just, guys, uh, is that dragging in a graphic there that people can kind of even see what these things tend to look like, just for uh, yeah. for argument's sake, just a complete mess of what it looks like initially. But yeah. you're you're basically starting off with phases and so on that are priority, and then you know breaking it yeah. down into the various different elements of the training and trying to figure out where is there too much overlap, you know, where is there too much work, where is the the overall load too much, yeah. um, and so yeah. on. But sorry, John, I interrupted you there. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great graphic. That's one of the I suppose that's one of the more busier models of what a periodization plan can look like. And strength and conditioning coaches love numbers and love graphs and love data, and sometimes miss the uh, miss the simple stuff. Yeah. But yeah, you're you're right. I mean, um, there's if you're if, I mean if you're working on your own, it can be it can be difficult. Um, it can be tricky to kind of assess progress, and it can be it can be tricky to kind of have someone you know when you don't have somebody kind of with you, kind of helping you and monitoring and giving advice, and you can kind of end up kind of going at things too hard and that. But from my perspective, uh, like if you've got an eight week or a twelve week block to build strength, I mean what what the research tells us is that you know just you can generally improve your strength between fourteen and twenty percent. Uh, across all of the kind of functional movement patterns and that's something as a ballpark you could be aiming for now in order to have uh, a measurement you have to have a starting measurement that you can work off as a benchmark so i'm here mm-hmm. now but where do i need to be in six or eight weeks time so you'll go to the gym and you you know you'll do all your needs analysis but you'll you'll do a functional movement screening and you'll do all these other concepts and then you'll start to lift weight and you'll do it in a safe and a controlled manner um, and from from kind of systematic observation, you can you can determine uh, what the ho- the heaviest weight that you can lift at a point um, within that program. Um, and we're we're talking about strength development at the moment, as opposed to power development. So just building out those strength capacities. So if my bench press, just as an example, at the start of a training program is 60 kilos, um, I should I should see improvements. And within that bench press across the scope of eight to 12 weeks and you, you mark those improvements so you might even see people at the gym picking up their diaries after they've put down the weight and they're writing down how much they lifted for uh, how long so the reps and their sets and their rest in between etc and they're monitoring their progress as they go 
and and that's one very simple way to do it. Um, but within all of that, then you, sh- you 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 by right you should be getting used to monitoring your own kind of physiological stress levels. Um, and this is quite topical at the moment. This idea of monitoring stress because there's so many wearable devices such as watches and heart rate mm-hmm. monitors and uh, and all and all of these kind of wellness and mood scores that you can get through through apps. You can then correlate what's happening within the gym with um, that kind of uh, quantitative element of your training with some qualitative elements of training. So how you're feeling, and uh, what is the app actually telling you? And some of the apps are really yeah. useful. Like uh, Elite Elite HRV is one. HRV is very popular at the moment in terms of monitoring stress and, and what your the you know the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system function is at. Um, and it can tell you when you're actually ready to keep training and to keep pushing hard, or it can actually identify when you should maybe just peel it back a little bit, take a down day, uh, do some active recovery, just take the, the foot off the pedal a little bit, um, and allow that you know allow that regeneration to to happen. So there's a couple of ways to 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 do it, Adrian. But I mean, you need to get those you need to get those 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 starting metrics first so you've got yeah. something to work off so if you're not going in and monitoring you don't have to be all dirty about it you know you'll know and you'll feel when you're getting stronger but take note of it because at the end of your block your eight or whatever 12 week block it is you should fundamentally and, and and you know by right you should see some sort of increase in your strength uh, output whether that's 10 percent, 15 or 20 percent. again it depends on on the individual does that answer your question mm-hmm. Yeah, I think really the, the bit to establish there is that like, okay, we, we've kind of come from, from, we're looking at our previous season, we're coming up with some sort of an analysis about where we need to focus our efforts for this season. And then we have to establish yeah. some baselines or metrics. So, I mean, it may be based on the previous year's assessments and metrics and, and, and uh, you yeah. know, uh, data that we've actually taken, or it might be based more on the kind of the experiential side of things of now you know didn't feel strong enough didn't feel I was explosive enough whatever it yep. happens to be or I was fine for the first two matches but I was getting gassed end around one third match my endurance isn't where it needs to be we need sure. to have a look at that but yep. then it's about okay we take that but there's no point in putting in a program if you don't have a baseline to to retest mm. on um, absolutely and, but I think that's also one of the things that we've talked about Richie where it's so addictive for people the supplementary training the ancillary training is so addictive to people because it's easier to measure than your mass yeah. training numbers numbers exactly. you, you, yeah. when you go to the to, when you go into the club or the gym and you're sparring you don't know how much you're improving only based on your feel and how it feels and then every time you spar somebody different it might okay i was i was exceptional in the last round this one i'm not so yeah. good and um, but it's it's yeah. that the yeah. stuff we actually made a post on this on the website during the week of like sometimes the most important things are the immeasurable things the things that we can't measure and um, but if then we fall in love as humans naturally with the, with the data as you said john and the numbers and things like that but i think it, it's very important that the the point that you make here on things like progressive overload things like that because if you just go in willy-nilly you're not going to really progress at any level that you need to and it needs to take time and it needs to take consistency and that's only going to happen when you have a bit of a structure and you have the program in place whereas if you're kind of just going in like free for all and you feel right i feel like deadlifting today you're not really going to see the progress that you need to do um, so the, yes. you need to have that that structure behind you and to be able to build like you said where you come from before and have those markers to, to progress on and push you forward yeah exactly i always think of progress being the water that fills the cup but in order to map progress you need to have a cup first of all to fill and yeah. you need to understand that there's certain mm-hmm. there's certain capacities that have your cup empty and then you can start to notice when the cup is starting to fill so you're right richie if you're just going in just doing random training and you're not even sure where you know what weaknesses or you know what what flaws for the want of a better word physical or physiological weaknesses that you're trying to to stimulate and trying to to build on well then you're just doing things in a random fashion and that may that's fine that might work for you and it might get you so far but when all things are equal at the very mm-hmm. top end of the wedge at the top of the pyramid where all the elite guys live you know things become uh, from a skills perspective and from a from an experience perspective things become uh, a lot more equal and this is where you know your physical conditioning and your preparation uh, becomes a lot more becomes a lot more important and a lot more focused i think so yeah can I, was, like we did um sorry adrian i was just going to say was, on the remember, on. we did the 10 skills there recently 
Yes. Um, so myself and Adrian just planned out 10 skills that we thought were most important for the elite level of ITF, kind of like at the profile. Mm. Yes. Yeah, um, and just a bit of fun. And we, we, we noticed that like some of the top ended skills weren't actually related to physical. But then Adrian put out as his number one resilience and the ability to be mm. solid and to be strong, to avoid injury. So you can actually train and actually perform. And I thought that that was really important because sometimes... Yeah. Yeah. From a personal point of view, I see people, like we said earlier, kind of like living and dying by their strength and conditioning, and then they're not really doing any skill yeah. work or their actual skill training as such. Um, but then when you yeah. when you look at it there, some of these physical attributes are kind of down towards the lower skill, at least from our point of view. I'm just interested to, to get your thoughts on that, John. Where, where do you think kind of things, the physical things fit, and would you agree that... The, the resilience and things like that are, are very important for your strength training. Things which people almost overlook because they, they just want to get the strength gains to be stronger. Yeah. Um, let, let, let me make sure I'm, I'm understanding your, your question. Right? Are we talking about that those that physical resilience, the, the you know the the athlete's ability to uh, to stay the pace over a, a number of rounds and a number of fights, Richie? Is that what you're alluding to? Even more long. Like like is it, is it, yeah, to yeah. Con continuously train and continuously be able to be there because you're avoiding injury because you have a good foundation yeah. with your strength training and things like that. Yeah, so, yeah, got you. Yeah, and it's it's. I mean, it, it, it's one of the massively positive benefits of training uh, in in a correct fashion in a, in a in a structured way. Is that while you're, you know, while you're benefit benefiting from getting stronger, from getting faster, from getting more explosive, etc., you're also building the capacity to be less injured all of the time, and to take on, uh, you know, higher loads in terms of your uh, your, your physical output, uh, which in turn then obviously uh, lends itself to longevity within the sport and, and longevity outside of the sport for when you mm -hmm. when you retire and you you bring all of that movement health and movement ability with you into into later life. So. I mean, I think that's resilience in a in a much broader sense, uh, in terms of the the physical ability. But yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, it's 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 right up there, and one of the reasons why you would try and train as systematic and as focused as possibly as you possibly can. So the bit that yeah, I was you, going to you kind of sit on that area. <laughs> Sorry, hey, go ahead, Richie, sit, no, no, finish this point, Richie. Right. I don't want I I don't want to go down a different rabbit hole till we get to the end of this one. <laughs> yeah, so just to, to kind of touch on that again john is it is it there are they the physical things do you think they they go hand in hand with the the skill because sometimes we see people yeah, kind of yeah. almost put one above the other and um, what are your thoughts yeah. on kind of where they all sit together yeah they're directly related richie and sometimes the mistake is made where there's a divergence between what you're doing physically for preparation mm. and what you should be doing specifically for your preparation and that's a it's a it's a huge problem um well, it's a big problem within combat sport in particular um, is that we get caught up in all the shiny things that really don't matter in terms of what we're doing for with training. So, for example, I'm going to train CrossFit in order to get better at my taekwondo or my kickboxing. And they're two different, very different outputs, two, two very different sports. But there's a misunderstanding there that one kind of relates to the other. And it's the same for kind of long distance running, but at much higher intensities where we're trying to... Uh, um, we're trying to replicate what an endurance cyclist or runner might do. Again, it's a totally different sport and a totally different performance output. So we have to be really careful about what we're doing from a physical preparation point of view and what we actually need to be doing from a sport-specific perspective. You know, and it goes back to the start where we, we, we spoke about what are the needs of the sport, what are the physical and physiological demands of the sport. And, you know, that should be, that, that really should be our, our, our focus for the entire spectrum of, of our training mm -hmm. program and try not to get caught up in doing things that, you know, it's what's termed kind of no man's land training, just doing stuff that may be actually counterproductive to your preparation, but would in fact have absolutely no positive impact on it um, whatsoever. So I think the more you can actually integrate your sport specific training into your conditioning, the better. Everything yeah. else is a okay. supplement. Mm -hmm. You're just building a base, just getting, yeah. you know, you're getting it, you're getting your concrete in at the very bottom. And then everything should be get, starting to get built on the sport specific needs of what you're doing and not get caught up in doing, uh, you know, hours of cycling, for example, where you could actually be doing very high quality rounds of sparring. You're going out to do this kind of uh, maximum steady state running, uh, which is actually what elite 
endurance athletes don't even do but you know there's a concept in combat sport that have to be kind of running as hard as they can for as long as they can it's madness Mm. yeah yeah it's madness it has no physiological relevance to our sport not even not even professional boxing for example which is much longer in in duration so it's about quantity over quality and we, we tend to forget sometimes that when you put the gloves on and put the gum shield in and the head guard goes on and you engage in high quality rounds of sparring it doesn't get any more specific conditioning on that right there and i think For sometimes sure. that's mm-hmm. lost on, on combat athletes we get kind of distracted by all of these other things and social media has uh, played a role in all of that that we need to be doing all of these yeah. other things in order to get better at, at, at our sport yeah i think they're I, I i think the closer they can be pushed together richie the better for everybody absolutely definitely yeah i agree I, I think that's a factor as well of so many combat athletes no matter what when you get to the very high level it becomes like uh, you're either in a training group because you have a club or a group within your, your environment of a substantial size or for most people yeah. it happens that okay most of the people around you aren't quite at your level and there's well what can I do on my own but I wanted to come back to the uh, filling that cup and the cup being the measure uh, because there's a, a lovely analogy that springs to mind here with that as well which is bringing us back to that periodization you fill your cup but every cup has a little leak in it so we have the, the issue of the detraining. So this, the, the second that our, you know, we move off of our strength cycle in a program or off of our you know, aerobic capacity cycle in a program, it starts to bleed away. But the holes are different sizes in all of the cups. So you can leave some things a little bit longer than others. So yep. like uh, my understanding of it would be, well, I could put an 8 to 12 week block in at one point in the year if you build my aerobic base. And that will hold over pretty well because the higher intensity work that I do helps to maintain that aerobic base as we work over time. However, sure. the yeah. second I step off of my strength cycle, if I don't have some maintenance, that strength starts to decline very, very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then it's different again with flexibility as an example. Like, and to my understanding, it would probably take you, I think the number they give is like 179 days or something ridiculously specific, but it's to do with the uh, like the the rate at which collagen fibers are replaced and and so on. That it's going to take you six or seven months to make a meaningful, lasting change to your mobility or flexibility, um, particularly around the joint tissues. But you know yeah. the effect tends to be fairly plastic. It doesn't reverse that quickly. But when it does reverse, it reverses like you know it takes just as long to you know to pick it up. So there are some things that are worth keeping in a program, I guess is what I'm saying, and some things that can be cycled in and out. So do you want to have a a little dip into that one? Yeah, absolutely. And I I think you've answered it uh, nicely there, Adrian. I think the the idea is to when you move when you move from 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 block to block is 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 not to park what you've just done in the previous block because there's going to be an element of kind of maintaining that. So, you, you know, you're right. So if you're moving from a strength block after eight weeks and you're moving into uh, you know, uh, developing now your kind of your your strength, speed, and working into your 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 power areas, and and that you you'll still maintain an area of maintenance of strength within the next block. Although the previous block was, uh, you know, was fundamentally focused on developing uh, strength, but now the next area of focus is slightly different. So the the uh, the, the focus will go on a, on different types of training, but you'll also keep an element of maintain trying to maintain that kind of base. Uh, when you move across and it's the same with your aerobic base training um, you know you do your 8 to 12 week block you you know you'll you'll, you'll uh, build out that capacity you'll measure that capacity and, and that, that can be easily done and then you'll work you'll start to reduce the volume of that long distance aerobic capacity building training um, and you'll start to focus on more on more high intensity so the percentage will reduce in terms of what you're doing for aerobic base building and the percentage will increase in terms of what you're doing for your anaerobic power and your anaerobic capacity but you'll still be doing an element of, of maintenance within the your, your aerobic base building it just won't be as much so you'll be doing maybe one day a week for example or two again depending and you yeah. might be doing uh, instead of instead of one uh, session of high intensity uh, and you will, you should be doing high intensity interval training even during the aerobic base building because um, you need to be developing your anaerobic capacities, um, and you can do that as long as they're not being done on the same day as building aerobic capacities because they're fundamentally opposed. They suppress each other when they're stimulated mm-hmm. too much. But you'll, yeah, when you move from block to block, you'll keep an element of what you've just done in terms of maintenance until you come to the last, you know, that, that cliche of that eight weeks out when it becomes purely focused on the performance objectives. 
So you become purely focused on uh, your, your anaerobic capacities and your, your power and explosive capacities and your sport specific movement patterns. Uh, and you kind of pull the door down on all the other stuff that you've been building and your foundation, I suppose, effectively is meant to be uh, in place so you can you can really ramp things up uh, with, your, with your last eight or 10 weeks out, uh, depending on, mm. on, on your plan. It brings up a very interesting point then as well, which I, I think is uh, uh, for people who are embarking on something like this for the first time, it feels counterintuitive. And it's to do with the balance of the, the, the overall, we say outputs early in the program, when you're focusing on things like your aerobic base and your strength work, the volume in terms of the amount of time you spend training is often much higher than in that last final eight weeks where the intensity yeah. is massively higher and you need to spend way more time recovering to be able to put in another yep. high intensity quality session. But you're like, sure. people find it very hard to understand that, look, the closer you get to the tournament, the less I want to see of you in training, almost, you know, it's like, okay, now tomorrow your job is to go for a walk or go for a swim or do whatever. And we'll sure. see you on Wednesday yeah. Yeah. after only doing yeah. a, a 60 or 75 minute session. Um, yeah. you know, mm. and I think people find I that. I think that's the mental thing as well, isn't it? Like when you get to the championships and things, you, you don't want to be kind of like sick of training and you don't want it. You want to be like ready to go in there. You want to be hungry to get on the mats. So it's just like almost kind of keeping the reins on a little bit just to, to make sure you peak right yeah. in time for the, the championships or whatever you're performing at. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cultural thing and, or, or an environmental um, maybe uh, thing, Richie, where, you know, if the if the athletes in an environment or within a culture that's all about just training consistently, well, then you're going to be have a really really hard time as a coach asking that athlete to to take the day off or to go for the walk. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it, a lot of it a lot of it really depends, and it can be it can be tough it can be tough at that stage when an athlete is starting to really ramp up and get in you know get into the zone to say, look, you need to just take a day off here or take a down day mm. and, and do something a little bit lighter. But no, you're right. I, it's just something that I, I've definitely found myself personally when I was uh, competing and then from the point of view of working with athletes, they kind of, uh, and it yeah. sometimes clashes with that weight management side of things where they're looking to almost like inter, like reintroduce or put in like steady state cardio, uh, you know, at that final phase. And it, it, it can kind of mean that, you know, every day is, it's like it's a high intensity training day and the next day is spending 30 or 40 minutes doing steady state cardio from purely a, like a faster cardio or a weight management kind of concept. And it's kind of like, mm, mm. okay, this isn't necessarily great. So, I mean, it, it, like for me, it's not bad that you have a high intensity day and then a low intensity recovery day and it, it kind of works yep. okay. But it just means that people feel it feel very strange about the fact that they're training less hours the closer they get to the competition and they want to change that they want to do more because more is definitely better right and i think it's just that element of the closer you get to that very specific demand of the competition and the more your training reflects yeah. those demands well you couldn't compete for two and a half hours a day like solid you couldn't do it so the closer you get to that intensity you know the, the more you're going to have to reduce the volume of, and the overall load of your well not the load the volume of absolutely. your training but the load is staying high Absolutely, and that's the. I think it's one of the overarching principles of periodization: is the closer you get to your event, the volume tapers off and the intensity uh, increases. So you're doing much less work in a, from a volume perspective, but the work that you're doing is going to be uh, higher in intensity from from an intent, intensity perspective, and it's going to it's going to reflect the demands and and the requirements of the sport. But I mean. When we talk about that kind of eight weeks out, and and we're now effectively getting into the into the area of of getting to, to you know to, into that peak performance condition, yeah, and we we talk about tapering and 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 tapering is a funny one because there's, there's a lot of kind of inter individual variability with tape. Some people don't like tapering, and and the younger the younger you are, the fitter you are, the less time you need uh, to taper and. The older you are, the more experienced you are, the longer you've been around, you might prefer a longer a longer taper. But depending or, or irrelevant to that, um, whether you like it or you don't like it, but the the overarching principle or the science behind it, and this this is lot this can be lost a lot on athletes and coaches, is that the idea behind it is to try and push the athlete so far into the realms of fatigue, but not too far that they, they start to fall into what's termed as overreaching. But they yeah. can push them close enough to that. So to accumulate enough fatigue 
that when they do start to taper, you have this kind of bounce effect of what's called this super compensation. So effectively, then the taper is the time, the, the, the downtime, the time off to recover and to regenerate from pushing them very delicately and, and you know very scientifically into the areas of, of fatigue where you're on a fine line. If it's too much, it's too much. You could be in trouble. Allowing them then to, to kind of regenerate over a couple of days or whatever the time, the agreed time is. And then allow that supercompensation, which is the body rapidly uh, adapting to the stress that it's just been under. And the, the principle or the concept is that when, when that happens, then the peaking, the peak performance then happens on the back of that. So the athlete goes to the event mm. uh, in peak condition. So that's yeah. the science behind tapering. When I say it's a science, behind, it's, it's, it's not a fine science because you're dealing with, you're not dealing with robots, right? You're dealing with this complex physiological and physical system which is the human being um and it takes experience it takes an experienced coach to know the athlete and it takes you know working with athletes over a number of years to to know uh, what tapering strategies work best you know, for them so if i yep. was coaching you richie and i just i gave you a program and i said right we're going to have a three-day taper i mean why why do i why do i think a three-day taper is going to be sufficient for you maybe one it might be a week what's your what's your opinion mm. so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of variability in it. especially when we travel away a lot to compete at the high level as well you have to factor that in because like there's a lot of time when you can't train and you can't and there is that weight kind of time of trying to take off that excess weight and things but the, the tapering is so important because i feel like personally uh, there's been plenty of times where i went abroad to go to euros worlds world cups whatever and you're like do you know what i think i was actually at my best about two weeks ago um, and you almost overdo it and you you just you, yeah. you just don't get it right and i think that that's very very yeah. important you end up sick absolutely yeah 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 because your immune yeah. gets hit doesn't it Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, everything everything can, can turn south pretty quickly when you start to, to move into the realms of overreaching and, and overtraining. And, mm. and, and, you know, effectively, you're going to go to your event. So if you if you've kind of and sometimes athletes will feel it, you know, they've peaked kind of two weeks previous. They're in great form. Everything's going well in the gym. They, you know, the test barring is going good. The feedback is good. They feel it. And it's two weeks out from the event. Well, then you've got a you know, you've got a task now to try and maintain that and to try and manage the athlete over the next two weeks but if they're not managed and they keep pushing it by the time they get to the event well they're burnt you know they're cooked and they're not going to be in peak condition and that's a big issue and how would you a, approach it's, it's that a problem if the athlete was peaking two weeks out mm-hmm. um i i i would personally richie i would be in a position to make sure that didn't happen um, because I'm constantly monitoring right, right. I'm constantly assessing and I'm constantly testing and retesting with my own guys uh, to see to see where they're at we've got um, you know we've got wellness scores and questionnaires that are done very informally now to be fair um, but you're always you're always monitoring and always watching and always asking how you feel and how are things today how do you think things are going you're watching outputs in the gym uh, you know, you're watching outputs in in the uh, in, in the ring. You're assessing. I'll always be assessing kind of the the, the balance between aerobic and anaerobic capacities, uh, because overtraining will affect both of them quite quite suddenly, and it can show in a test. So, from a personal perspective, Rich, I I, I, I try not to let that happen. But if I was working with an mm. athlete who wouldn't be in my my camp, I suppose for the want of a better word, um, and they've reached kind of peak condition two weeks out from the event. It's difficult. It's really difficult to say you need to you need to factor in some downtime here within this last two weeks. You know, you need to maybe focus on some mobility work or keep yourself busy. But just mm. it's really, really difficult to maintain an athlete's mm. peak ability over the course of two weeks because the science tells us that it generally can last for about three or four days and then they're on the way down. You know, then they're yeah. starting to uh, they're, they're starting to see the detrimental effects of staying in peak condition for too long, and it's a balancing act. It's a very very fine balancing act. But if I think if they've yeah. peaked, if they've really peaked two weeks out, Richie, I think they're cooked. It's going to be difficult psychologically. It's going to be tough on them. Physically, it's going to be tough on them. Um, it's going to take a very experienced coach and a very adaptive athlete, I think, uh, to be able to cope with that. Yeah, I think it's something that we do occasionally come across. Like you'll see it sometimes at the squad training sessions where someone is just that little bit uh, too on edge, too early kind of thing, and mm. uh, and it really is a it really is a challenge because, as you said, it's not a reversible state. 
it's uh, you know you, no. you have to cycle to it and cycle off of it and your ideal Absolutely. is that you're using that taper to just get that last one percent push you know to the, the very very yeah. top of that peak condition uh to where you're yeah. you know like it, it's a very hard thing to explain to less experienced athletes as well that you should feel like utter trash the week before you travel you should probably have one of your yep. worst training sessions almost like emotionally the last one you should be doubting good indicator whether you're, Adrian, yeah. yeah you yeah. should be doubting whether you're ready to go uh you know almost there while not feeling like physically battered or destroyed necessarily you might be fatigued yeah. but like you should be feeling that and then that last three-day taper or you know i mean if the, the way it works with kickboxing and taekwondo i think is very similar you end up where the competition you're traveling on a sunday or monday for a competition that starts midweek is usually the scenario so the taper unusually for us we don't get a training camp you know most of the time out mm. at the, the venue so your taper happens while traveling which is a bizarre thing so you're looking usually trying to get in a training session of some intensity on like a yeah. monday night on arrival in another country in the dark in a car park and it's just far yeah. from ideal and mm. um, so you're hoping that the, the the hosts understand the science and have decided to provide you with a nice training venue with mats or with something yeah. so that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish but like that's typically where you're at so as you say it's like you almost want like we'll often train up until the sunday before we travel like we'll have a maybe even a squad session the sunday before we travel and that's the last high intensity session and then you back off and do only a couple of brief sessions on the monday tuesday before say maybe the weigh-ins on the yeah. tuesday and you compete on the thursday or friday so you, you you've got that short taper um but it's yeah. very hard to control because of the travel so i think that's yeah that's a, a very interesting place it's really to hard and then compounded by by the fact that it, many athletes are trying to maintain a weight so they've gone on this yeah. kind of weight management six week kind of uh, cut uh, to try mm. and get themselves into a weight category and, and and that just adds an extra layer of complexity to the uh, to you the don't issue. know why you're feeling crap you know yeah so am yeah. i feeling crap because i'm hungry or am i feeling, and, and like yeah. under <laughs> undernourished like have i not got the calories to take on the the, the exercise loads that are being presented exactly. for me exactly versus exactly. am i feeling yeah. crap because i have reached a level of muscular neurological fatigue that's a different thing actually yeah. that jumps to mind and it's not a great segue but it'll have to do the whole concept of fatigue and measurement and so on that goes with it so like it's a very popular thing to do if the budget's available to like enlist a battery of tests for athletes and to see that they're making progress and you know we can look at that sure. but there's also a little bit of an element of that that's tied to fatigue where you know there's a perception out there that you know you get tired when you know the lactate the lactate builds up in the muscle and like i i'm very much putting this out there as a perception thing i'm a, I'm a little bit more aware of the science of that yeah, of course yeah. there's a there's yeah. a perception that yeah you're building up so much lactate in your muscle that you know uh, that you're experiencing experiencing fatigue there's the concept of well what actually what are the other components what are the components that actually make up fatigue and why do we feel fatigued and like, how are we going to use this periodization to address that over time? Yeah, well, fatigue, where do you start with fatigue? A multifactorial complex yeah. issue, if there ever was one. There's Pandora, Pandora's right box having the, the lid lifted. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do you start? Where do you start? I mean, look, yeah, it's a massively complex area. And, and there's, there's areas of fatigue within sports science that are still not fully understood. Uh, right from central ner nervous system fatigue to localized fatigue and everything and everything you'll be between. glad to know we well, knew I, nothing better 20 years ago so it was it, this was one of the kind of yeah, the great, yeah, the exactly. great new frontiers yeah. 20 years ago we're still in the same we're still in the same boat yeah yeah i think what what we can what we can do as coaches and athletes is kind of deal with the uh the identifiable uh, what we can identify and what we can measure uh, within the realms of fatigue and to try and address um, the issue based on what we can see and what we can monitor and, and, and test. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, it is complex. I mean, from, from my perspective, um, I, I do have access to, to certain little gadgets and technology that allows me to run, uh, you know, lactate blood profiling tests and, and, and stuff like that. And I'm working on, I'm working on a, a, a field test, I suppose, just for, for combat sport. Um, to bring all of those gadgets into a semi-live environment or a, st a simulated sparring environment where we're monitoring heart rate, we're monitoring the um, rates of perceived exertion at the end of a mm. round, we're taking blood lactate at the end of a round, we're actually going to do um, 
we're going to use clickers to count punch combinations and kick combinations at the end of the round and 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 see if we can monitor what's happening over the course of three or four rounds whether that kind of uh, that in, in endurance ability needs to be tweaked, whether the um, anaerobic capacity needs to be tweaked, uh, or whether all of it needs to be tweaked or scrapped, or whatever the case, whatever the case may be. So, I think you can only deal with what what you can deal with within your, you know, what's what's relevant to you at a, at a point of time in your program in terms of monitoring uh, fatigue and, and and addressing it as best you can. Uh, it's a massively complex area, Adrian, as you know. So. I'm not too sure where I'm going to put that lid back on the can of worms. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was just something mm-hmm. I wanted to throw out there because, like I said, there's a because most of us don't have access on the regular to the likes of um, uh, lactate yeah. profiling, VO2 max testing, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. isokinetic yeah. power output, yeah. you know, measurements and so on. There's a, there's yeah. a tendency for coaches to assume, well, if we had that, we'd be able to solve the puzzle. And the reality, of course, for me is that, well, like they give you information but they give yep. you incomplete information always. So okay. one of the Absolutely. problems that we had 20 yeah. years ago, which is still a problem, is like you said, John, you're looking at finding a way to test in situ for martial arts mm. and on combat sport. 20 years ago, they were still trying to find ways to test for swimmers, for uh, for ro- like rowers. You could, they were testing people on a Concept 2 ergometer. Um, but, yeah. you know, and that was as close as you could get to being out in a boat, but it isn't the same. Um, so oh. basically your experience of like your your lactate curve would change depending on whether you were on a bike or a treadmill or you know uh whatever it happened sure. to be mm. and so finding mm. something that's relevant to us is tricky and even if you have a number well what's a number that means you're going to win you know does a <laughs> you yeah. know it, we have yeah. a very multifactorial yeah. sport so if just having a better lactate okay. profile doesn't mean that we win more but it it's it's one of those correlates that you know if it's good enough it, it shouldn't stop us from, you know, that shouldn't be the factor that stops yeah. us from winning. And I suppose that's that's where you're getting with it. And, and it links to fatigue, mm. you know, because our yes. experience of fatigue, I mean, the, the most profound statement that I've come across in all of the years of talking about it is your, and it, it links to that rate of perceived exertion. You feel fatigue based on the differential between the expected effort and the experienced effort. So if you yes. went into a spar and you thought it was going to be pretty okay like a, a seven or an eight on an rpe scale and you felt like it was way harder than that it you, you're going to experience your fatigue way sooner yeah. so you might still have yeah. all of the energy yeah. in the muscles you might still have you know freely available blood uh, blood glucose and all the rest of it you might be producing atp perfectly efficiently through the energy systems you like but you might be feeling like your legs are heavy or falling off you you might be feeling like giving yeah. up and it's down to the perceived effort um like it, it yeah as you said it's a fascinating science and more than the scope of this particular one but i think it's just important to touch on that that you know while we can measure Absolutely. everything we don't necessarily yeah. have the best data for like there's no one mm. measurement that's going to make you a world champion they're all just factors. absolutely not yeah the biggest yeah. i think the most important measure regardless of what type of technology you can use the most important measure is based on a question to the athlete how are you feeling yeah. And I can tell so much mm. because I mean what you're measuring when you when you bring all those gadgets to the gym is physical output. But again, we're not dealing with robots, we're dealing with human beings who have other things going on in their lives. So what's the what's the level of cognitive stress, you know, psychological stress? You know, is there issues at in a relationship? Are they under pressure from college or work or school or whatever? You know, is all of that is all of that stress being dragged into the gym? Well of course it is, you know, it's gonna come in with them. Is For that sure. going to affect performance output? Absolutely. How do you measure it? You, well, you can't. <laughs> you know, you, you just have to be aware that it's there. You have to have the relationship with the athlete where you can have the conversations. And you, you know, this is where the coach's eye is so important. You know, when guys come into the mm. gym, into the into the into the hall, you're you. I'm automatically just assessing, and not very, uh, you know, not very abruptly, but from a distance, just assessing how the social group is interacting. You can see if a head is down. You know the personalities, um, and you can you can start to kind of schedule and build the training plan for that particular session based on what you're observing. And you might interact and ask a question: "How's everything? How's whatever?" And you'll get you know you might get answers that'll tell you this person's not feeling it today. So why would you put them through the ringer? You know why would you expect mm. certain performance outputs? It's just going to compound. They're already uh, you know the the, the, psych- the psychological stress that's already. Uh, within them you know so there's there's a hell of a lot of understanding your athletes knowing the person 
first and foremost. You can have all the gadgets in the world, all the VO2 max, metabolic carts, thousands of euros worth of technology. It all means jack shit if you don't know the person you're working with. It means mm. nothing. You might as well be sending your Ford Cortina into the mechanic to get the clutch fixed. <laughs> you know, it's just, and that's the that's the, the 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 absolute importance and the art of coaching, which is sometimes lost within yeah. physical preparation, where it just all becomes about numbers and curves and and kind of performance objectives. When you miss the big picture that you're dealing with a complex human being that has emotions and has a life outside of the sport and and has all of that you know psychological stress and issues that they have to deal with um and you need to be very cognizant of that as a, as a coach first and foremost mm, that's the term that you used there john was spot on that the one of the art of it because that's what yeah. it is it, even though it's a science yeah. it's an art and it's an art, art form to get that right and understand people as well but yeah. if we were just uh, yeah. to kind of maybe this is a good time for people to get in questions we already have some yeah, here we in have the live a few. chat so um but before oh, we get I forgot stuck we were into live john, yeah <laughs> say again richie <laughs> Just before we get stuck into them, if you were to kind of sum up the the topic of today, how are you going to, we say, prepare yeah. for, we say, three months down the line for a competition? What would you say in a, in a paragraph, a practical takeaway for people? Um, understand where you're at right now. Understand what you think you need to be developing and what you need to be building on in terms of your capacity. So try to identify what, what's the weakness in your in your armour. And then work to kind of build out that weakness and, and remove it. Our overarching principle is always the physical and physiological demands of the sport. What do I need in order to be at the very best within my sport? If I'm a, if I'm a soccer player, mm. I need to have uh, the you know I need to be able to to uh, sprint several times. I need to be agile. I need to be able to decelerate, change a direction. I need to be able to jump and kick a ball. In ITF, Taekwondo, and micro kickboxing, the the physical and physiological demands require us to be able to kick well, to be able to kick fast, to understand the rules of the sport, to be agile, to be able to react fast, to be able to explosive within our hand and, and, and uh, kick combinations. And I need to be physically fit in order to do that several times over the, the course of a round or rounds. So identify where you're at and just do something that's going to build that out um, and, and kind of remove those weaknesses and reach out and look around for information from people who you trust, coaches who you trust or sources that you trust that can give you some solid information. And be careful not to fall into the trap of some of these social media influencers that are trying to get you to buy something off them. So they've got secrets to mm -hmm. massive conditioning or crazy power punching, kicking and stuff like that. So avoid those fellas like the, like the plague. And keep it simple. That's a great cool. time to plug your Instagram as well, John. You're doing some great work there with the Combat Institute and putting up some good posts. Do you want to leave people yeah. know about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've got a little Instagram thing going, um, Combat Sport Institute. I'm not selling anything at all. No intentions. I'm just putting up information. And I'm not even saying you need to be doing something this way, but maybe just stimulating uh, a thought in your head. Um that might question why you're training in a certain way or point to certain references or other resources that might help you to understand why you're training in a certain way. The overarching principle of what I'm trying to achieve, I think, with the Instagram stuff is, is to help athletes and coaches critically evaluate what they're doing and to point to some evidence-based research that could help in their training programs. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. So we did have a few questions that came in and uh, obviously while we're chatting away here, feel free to get in another question. We'll pop it off, John, and see what he comes up with. Um, but uh, we have Marco here from the south of Italy, which I hope you're getting better weather than we are. It's not great at the moment. Um, so I think he's asking for in the first instance, instance, is there a change in training in these recent years? So have you seen a change in how people are training and preparing uh, in, in the last few years? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, sometimes, I think, is the right answer. Sometimes, I see, unfortunately, we see a, a lot of uh, combat athletes training the same way consistently and, and expecting different different results. But I think what social media and what the internet in general has done, it has brought information that might have been hard to find in, in recent years, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, in terms of evidence-based research uh, which would be hidden away in sports science journals, locked away behind databases and paywalls and stuff. There's a lot of that information is now relevant and accessible to people. And you'll find coaches now starting to, to uh, 
interact with that information. And then conversely, um, you've got uh, university degrees and college degrees that are now focusing a lot on, on coaching, um, on coaching science and performance science. So there's avenues for coaches to continue their their uh, education and upskilling from mm. their you know their formal coach education and moving into kind of uh, you know, third level education and other courses that will help do that. So that's all very that's all very accessible now. And, and I think coaches, a lot of coaches are are interested in in uh, you know keeping learning and, and maintaining their skills. And then the result of that, to answer the question, is that certain training modalities do change because they're interacting with, with uh, the research. The evidence is saying, maybe you shouldn't do this, you should be doing this. And coaches are accessing the, uh, the quality information and applying it to their, mm. to their environment. But on the flip side, then, there's a lot of coaches who have no intentions of skilling, no intentions of continuous learning. And we'll just keep doing random stuff uh, time and time again, hoping at one stage to kind of break the mold. Uh, but, you know, Einstein said, the, you know, the uh, definition of insanity, we all know it, you know, doing one thing over and over again and, and expecting different results. And unfortunately, combat sport and maybe all sports are going to suffer that. But oh, yeah, to answer definitely. the question, I think, yes, things have changed over the years, um, but they'll only change where you've got kind of... Um, uh, coaches who are, are interested in, in learning and they're not afraid to step outside of their comfort zone and take on new information and apply it in their environment. So, yeah. And good sources as well, John, because you see, um, like, for example, UFC embedded there and things, people taking stuff from that and it's like it's not really practical to yeah. our sport per se. Um, mm -hmm. So it's no. getting those correct resources as well to understand and, and kind of upskill yourself, like you said, yeah. in the right way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is where the patience um, it really plays a factor from a coaching perspective. So you, you, you might not, if you're, if you're engaging with the research and you're reading, you might not get the answers that you're looking for. I think you have to go into the information with an open mind and to be able to extrapolate what's happening within the research. And that might be from another sport. So there's a lot of work done within endurance sports, running and cycling, for example, mm -hmm. on the balance between aerobic and anaerobic capacity. Now, what they do in their sport has no bearing on what we do in our sport but we can take what the research uh, tells us in terms of the relationship between those two physiological capacities and then start to, to, to tweak it and to, to use it within our own sport through trial and error, through testing and you know playing around with certain uh, training modalities to see how it impacts mm -hmm. for us. So the information is out there, but you might need to be patient in piecing it all together. So that paper says this, this book says that, that podcast said this, uh, you know, so be in all of that information uh, and take the pieces that are relevant to the sport and see if you can put them together to form, uh, you know, to form some conclusive evidence for our, for, for our own sport, for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important yeah, as definitely. coaches that you, you have to be open to being wrong and, you know, and trying things oh, totally. and, and, you know, and changing things when you are, you know, wrong. And even I, I think from my own perspective, when you, you, you talk about science and how it evolves, uh, science tends to go down those like rabbit holes as well and people get att attracted to a particular way of thinking and sometimes you know yeah. the, the evidence builds and builds and builds in a particular direction until it falls over uh, so yeah. you often find that you know even with following the latest science it, it eventually folds back in itself and it's somewhere between the two polar points you know so it, yeah. it's um, yeah. Yeah. always worth being and critical. that's kind of that Go was what we started with this as well, Adrian, wasn't it? The whole idea of like skill acquisition for us, John, in um, Taekwondo and stuff like that wasn't, there was no real evidence. We had to pull it from other sports and have conversations with people yeah. and try to tie it all together. And that was kind of one of the original motivations for myself and Adrian kind of getting this going as well. Mm. Definitely. So Marco had a follow-up yeah. question, which is, uh, I think asking, is it more important to keep the, the mind and body in balance or I think to promote a, a more aggressive, uh, you know, style of fighter? Um, so I, I, I am definitely paraphrasing, and apologies, Marco, if I haven't got this 100% right, but uh, so do you think it's more important to have somebody with mind and body in balance or uh, to promote aggressiveness or uh, uh, utilizing... Mm impulse control i suppose but yeah what uh have you any thoughts yeah. on that question yeah I'm, I'm not a fan of extremes in any shape or form i think having a, a balanced fighter is always going to be beneficial a balanced athlete um is always going to be beneficial both in, in mind um, and in body i mean there's elements of our sport that require tenacity and whether you want to call that aggression uh, mm. i'm not a fan of the word tenacity resilience mental toughness 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Con- controlled aggression. Um, there's there's an element needed, Marco, for sure. Um, I, I have coached aggressive fighters. I mean, they're not from my camp, but I've I've coached as a national coach. I've coached an array of different types of people, um, and some of them some of them are naturally aggressive. Um, and I've never seen a fight where that's actually assisted them in some way. And you'll always, as a coach, kind of have a bit of a bit of a battle on your hand in between rounds trying to stabilize emotion so you can actually have a constructive discussion about strategy and then with a great with overly aggressive fighters everything becomes a distraction you know the, the referee is wrong or the judge made a wrong score or the boot won't fit or, or whatever so i think to answer your question i think balance is always good um but obviously understanding our sport requires an amount of that tenacity that controlled aggression uh, but I think that mm. controlled aggression is kind of built into that that balanced athlete that they know when they need it and they know when to pack it away when it's not needed. But if it becomes an overbearing uh, part of their character, they're tough. They're tough to coach. Uh, they're great when they win, but my God, they're awful when they lose. You know, it's everybody's fault yeah. except their own. You know, so it's a good question. Taking things in a, a completely different direction. Uh, our, our good buddy Donald Donahue. Uh, for older athletes returning after a break from training, is it possible to fully regain lost flexibility? Hashtag asking for a friend. So uh, he's yeah. happy to be listening to the question. chat. Is that is that Donald, is it? It's Donald. Yeah. He's looking good, isn't he? <laughs> I, think, I think, Donald, you're way past him. I don't think <laughs> you can come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> so you might as well stay where you are, man. Because uh, if you come back, well, then I have to look at come back. It's yeah, a great, great question, and I'll be brilliant. Don't lose the king you. of comebacks. Um, Let's be fair. King of comeback. Why not? Yeah, why not? Good stuff. Good, to, good to hear from Donald. Um, I hope he's keeping well. Um, it's a good question. I'm not. I'm not sure. I have the answer to that, Donald. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not too tuned in on the flexibility issues or the workings of muscles through flexibility and, mod- and, and mobility and what happens uh, when you take a considerable time away from the sport. Adrian, you might have. You might have some information in relation to that. Would you? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that you're fighting against always is that with age comes plasticity in terms of muscle tissue. So in other words, it becomes less yeah. and less um, adaptable to change, particularly, you know, over yeah. time. Joints tend to also get a little bit grungier with uh, with use over I, time. I so, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm feeling that too. Uh, but the uh, the issue with that, of course, is that, you know, is it a, a you know, a, a, a a skill a motor pattern is it something that can be improved you know at any point in time yes so you can always add strength yeah. you can always add flexibility can you recover your athletic best it's uh, unlikely um is the answer to that unless that was uh, you know that was something that wasn't particularly explored so we often see it where someone comes to us at 40 and they're more flexible than they ever were at 45 you know so at 45 years of age they're more flexible than they ever were in their you know in their adult life and that can happen because they never explored the reaches of it. But for those of us who've been in Taekwondo or kickboxing or whatever, like we've gone as far as we could push at a particular point in time. And then, you know, everything after that is a controlled backwards slide, I think. And, and like what we're trying to do is preserve as much as we can, both our strength and yeah. our, our flexibility as we age. And I think the, the reality of it is yeah. that, yeah, we're, we're, we're never going to regain in full what we had, but we can certainly... Uh, you know, we, we can improve taking where we are now as a starting point and improve again from there. And like, yeah, I, I definitely feel like I'm starting that journey again and again and again every other year. You know, so there's some, there's some yeah, yeah. setbacks, some injury, and you're starting again. You know. Yeah, yeah, and um, we we can never, and I know this from experience. Like, we can never go back. And I think you've alluded to it, Adrian, already. You can never go back to the the levels of intensity that you would have been used to when you were. No. 10 or 15 years younger and, and that's something i struggle with um and because i i didn't fully grasp that or didn't maybe recognize that for myself i ended up pulling more injuries and having troubles with hamstrings and kind of uh, hip flexors and groin trouble because i'm i'm trying to i'm trying to replicate training that i would have done 10 years ago um, and it took me a while to come to a position in my own head where it's not for me anymore. It's not about having that performance ability, but it's more about being able to just move uh, healthily, you know, having good mobility as I head for my mid forties in the next couple of years. Um, and just understanding what, what it is you want to get from your training and then just uh, adjusting that a- a- accordingly. Yeah, so something something to be mindful of. Mm, for sure. Um, mm. 
Then we have one from Damien, who's uh, jumping in traditionally with a question, or one of the kids, whoever's using his account today. Um, so, hi lads, would you ask if a person was all right uh, if you see someone down, or would you try to work around it? So I think this is coming if back they, to... What, say that again, Adrian. If you were seeing someone was down, this is coming b- back to our chat about, you know, engaging with the athletes and using yeah. a little bit of the yeah. uh, the soft skills rather than the uh, the technical measurements to figure out where a person's at or how to address their training. So I think Damien's yeah. asked now, would you ask them directly or would you just make an assumption and try to work around it? Yeah, it, dep- it depends on the relationship, I guess. You know, if you're close to the athlete and you've been around them for a long time, um, and some of the girls that are in my camp um, have been training with me since they've been eight, nine years of age. They're all young adults now heading into their early 20s. I've developed a relationship where um, I can ask them directly, you know, how, how are things? You, you, know, you know, you're not yourself. Uh, what's happening? And the result of that sometimes has ended up in a, a private conversation where, you know, tears have happened and stuff. And it might be relationship issues or just general physical and psychological stress is just a little bit too much for them. So it really depends on your relationship. If you can ask, it's always good to ask and show that you care without being too intrusive. Uh, but mm-hmm. if you can't ask and you don't have that relationship, uh, a good coach's eye, a good intuitive eye might might lead you to uh, working around it in some way. Maybe if you've got a pressurized session, you might get them to assist in that session as opposed to be directly involved in it. So if, if I didn't know the athlete that well, but I've kind of I've twigged that there might be something up they're not themselves, I might get them to do a little bit of pad work, maybe to do a little bit of assisting in terms of coaching, some time, uh, you know, get them to do some performance analysis work with the video, keep them involved, keep them included, but maybe just uh, maybe just keep the stress of the session away from them uh, a little bit. If the, if, if the session allows for that, you know, if you've got a, a national team session and everyone has to be fired up and, you know, pumped for the session, you might, you might deal with that differently. But I think it very much depends on the relationship between the coach and the athlete and if you can ask by all means ask and you know just be just be careful as well because you're dealing with people's emotions and frustrations but i think that's a that's a very very good point and kind of talk, segues into the idea of well what kind of relationship have you built up with your athletes as a taekwondo coach and one of the issues can be that if you if you can't transition particularly into adulthood and change the nature of your relationship with your athletes you run into difficulties and it becomes very hard to ask these very relevant questions and these questions come yeah. up more and more as people go into early adulthood, their lives change substantially. And if you lose touch with that because you say hello at the door and say goodbye at the door and in between is whatever you plan for that class, you know, then it's difficult. But if you're engaged and actively involved with them from, you know, one end of the week to the next and you know what's going on in and around the the training hall, I think that really does help to get to the bottom of those kind of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, John, as well, I have here, just on a a personal... uh, question when you mm. where were you guys in wacko you also get to have a, a club coach next year how do you find that compared to sometimes can it be too much do you think it's like what, what's the balance of, of that like compared to we say itf where it might be just one coach in the seat at competition of course yeah of course um I, I i i like it i like the concept um when i when i first started to travel with the team i was a club coach and i found it really inclusive to be able to be on, on the side of the match coaching my fighter along with uh, a member of the national coaching team. Um, you learn a, you learn a hell of a lot from a coaching, from a club coach's position. position. You, you learn a hell of a lot. You, you know, you're, you're at the cold front. You'll be able to interact with your athlete. The, the roles changed then for me as I became national coach and I had to work with club coaches. And uh, it, it, it really depended on, on the philosophy of the club coach and their style and method of coaching. Mm-hmm. Some of them very, very good, um, where I would just be assessing and analysing and watching scores, and the athlete would be listening to the club coach um, in the ideals in the ideal sense because they know their voice, you know, they've got the relationship with them. Uh, but some cl- some club coaches, um, I won't say club coaches, some coaches are just very, very poor communicators, and they become overawed by the uh, the emotions of the event, and they become a complete distraction to uh, to their fighter. And that's really that's really difficult uh, to try and manage because you don't, obviously you don't want to be causing any issues on the side of the mats because uh, you know you don't want you know, you want you want the fire to be totally and completely focused. So you, you'll use intervention strategies as best you can. You might just suggest that the coach just maybe just you know just to stay quiet a little bit and let them work through it themselves. You want to be coaching athletes who are making decisions for themselves instead of joystick coaching, mm-hmm. uh, hitting buttons and you know yeah, trying to drag them around control. the ring. 
<laughs> with the with the little joystick in their hand, uh, and the coach is actually fighting the fight for them, and it's a terrible situation to yeah. be in. Um, and you, you get when the athlete comes back in between the round, and they sit down, and they're you know they're they're their emotions are running high and their coach just hasn't stopped talking and they're looking at you as a national coach for some direction for some clarity and you have to wait you have to wait until the club coach stops talking and then you have to say something with whatever 10 seconds you have left that's going to be positive impactful so yeah it can be it can be really tough so there's pros and cons to it mm. Richie as a club coach my philosophy was to be um was to be there and learn and listen to the national coaches and, and to uh, engage with the athlete. And that's just my style. It worked for me as a national coach. Working with club coaches, it very much it very much depends. They can be an absolute... And I'm not trying to say there's a difference. I'm not trying to say there's a difference. I'm a national coach and you're only a club coach. I'm not trying to put it across like that. And I hope it doesn't come across like that. But again, we're dealing with human beings and some people yeah. are just different at dealing with scenarios and situations. It's an extra relationship to manage some, at ringside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. People exactly. shout constantly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's awful. Yeah, yeah, it's awful. Um, well, it, it also it comes stretching. down to, you know, if that relationship is to work well, the same as the coach-athlete relationship, it's something that needs to be developed and practiced over time. And, oh, and, yeah. and the issue is that very often, you know, you're going to have that difficulty where the club coach, the athlete and the national team coach may not have had the deep, detailed conversations around how this relationship mm. is going to work, how it's going Absolutely. to go who's responsible yeah. for what, yeah. et cetera, beforehand. So yeah. there's a lot of uh, yeah. a lot more necessity for strong communication, strong values, strong, you know. Setting uh, expectations, absolutely. Yeah, and, and empowering that athlete because now the athlete is outnumbered two to one. So, you know, they, they've also yeah. got to be, yeah. you know, very confident in their voice to kind of make sure they're getting what they need. So, yeah, there's there's quite a bit yeah. in it. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, uh, a, a as very... As national coaches, we... we, we as national coaches, we only get to see the athlete at national camps, where they go back to their club coach consistently two or three times, two or three times a week. So yeah. it can be it can be difficult to build up that relationship, and and it can be it can be mm. difficult to get in in the into the middle of the relationship between the coach and the athlete. Um, and it, it's already kind of developed. Uh, you know, there, there's an understanding that the athlete uh, will be shouted at and continuously talked at uh, by the coach. And we don't get this. We don't get to witness that or experience that until the actual event. And at that stage, it's probably too late. So your point is absolutely right, Adrian. Mm. Yeah, there's an there's an amount of management and just setting expectations, managing expectations, and the build up to that. Very cool. Um, so we have a question here from uh, Ali, who's uh, watching from Mozambique. Uh, so is it true that working too much on the, your flexibility can lead you to weaken your impact, your strike impact, or your power? I suppose. So that's a very yeah. um, that's a very old concept Topical. as well. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I guess um, Ali, it depends on on how you're you're working on your flexibility. And um, there there is science there to suggest that you know emphasizing too much static stretching uh, can actually negatively impact the ability of the muscle to perform uh, explosively, or to it might re- reduce the power outputs of 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 a. Uh, of a uh, muscle group so it, it really depends and i guess it boils back to moderation and doing everything in a, in a, in a balanced approach so well i'm not saying don't stretch or don't static stretch there's a place for it i think if you spend most of your time kind of hammering into static stretching um and uh you know spending a, an absurd amount of time kind of pressing into into stretches that might not be even relevant to to the sport you may you may uh, reduce your ability to, to kick fast to kick powerful. Um, from a personal perspective, I spend most of my training life um, trying to force myself into into the splits. That was my goal. It probably had no bearing at all on what I was trying to do within the sport. And uh, the result of that now is that I've got hamstrings like uh, ice creams. They don't. <laughs> I, I can. I, like I can barely run fast without a hamstring saying no you're not doing this and that's and that's the end of it you know so there's look there's an element of moderation and just understanding where it fits I guess too much of too much of one thing is going to reduce the ability of another thing so mm. yeah don't don't do it too much but no no where it fits I guess I think you know this is one of those things where the uh, the advice can be accurate but it depends on who's applying it so you know, for, for most people, the kind of flexibility work that's going to reduce your ability to generate uh, or, you know, that's going to slow your rate of force production is so much work 
that you probably aren't doing it anyway so don't stress it you know it, worry, yeah it, it's that kind of thing where i think it's like well if you take a right we're going to have three repetitions of you know 60 to 90 seconds per stretch and we're going to have three repetitions of that over a 20 or 30 minute period and then we're going to try and generate force you're in the wrong ball, ballpark mm. altogether absolutely but yeah, if yeah. you have a low intensity day where you're working on your mobility after you know uh, after a steady state run or a, you know a, a, some time on the roar and you spend 20 or 30 minutes going through your various positions and working on your mobility whether it's with isometrics whether it's with pnf whether it's with statics or, or a, an active hold you know that's not going to have the same impact on your ability to generate yeah. force you know and it's a ca- case of like I, I think a point you made earlier john actually comes back which was like look there are some things that are just physiologically you know discrete and they impact one another and trying to do uh something for you know the longer steady state you know aerobic capacity stuff on the same day as you're trying to do something at a high intensity it's counterproductive it doesn't really work you know you might want to do that on separate days and it it, you know it, it could be quite the same in terms of you know on a day that you're hoping to develop the you know the or work on the power output in your kicks and punches and particularly for us in take one would be with the kicks you know maybe that's not the day to have your 30 minute stretching session um exactly. you know yeah. and and then we shouldn't yep. be impacting one or the other too severely exactly but mm-hmm. i think that no, does no, bring no, us no, to the end of the questions but uh Early. richie do you have any questions you want to uh bring us back to to base with or no, I thought that was a, a, gr- a great um, episode and, and kind of practical takeaways for people, especially watching, especially in the current times that we're in. People probably have been uh, slack for a while now and they're looking to get back into things and push things forward. So just want to thank you for your time first off, John, um, no and problem. for sharing the, no the knowledge you you've gained over, the, over a few years. Not a problem at all. And if anyone out there is interested in getting in touch, my email is john at combatsport.ie. I'm not selling anything, no obligations. I'm very happy to send you on information of papers, texts, books, PDF copies of stuff that I'll send you on. Share the love, spread the resources around, and let's change the mindset for our physical conditioning within our sport. So That's thanks for having fun. me on, guys. Always Fantastic, a pleasure, John. John. Always a pleasure. Cheers, boys. Lovely. Have a lovely day. Catch you all soon. Thank-